the scripture reading this morning is, is Joshua 24, 14 through 28. If you have a Bible, you can uh, feel free to open up to that. And our scripture reader this morning will be Debbie Taves. And so she can head on up. If you would please stand and face the center of the room. We do this because scripture is at the center of our lives and the center of our hearts. It's everything we need to know. It's our rule book for this life. Hear the words of Joshua 24, 14 through 28. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. <clears throat> then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods... He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people each to their own inheritance. You may be seated. Thank you, Debbie. We'll start this morning with a phrase. Maybe it's familiar, maybe it's not. And the phrase is life markers. Life markers. Life markers are these times or experiences in our lives that transition us and, and propel us into new phases of life. They're a life marker where on one, before this life marker happened, life was one way. We lived one way. And then this life marker happened and afterwards life looks different. And, and when, when we're in these phases of life, these life marker times, we often begin to ask questions. And there are a lot of who am I questions. When we're in a life marker time, we ask questions like, who will I be in this next phase of life? Who will I be? Do I like where my life is headed? Can I learn something from my past to move forward into this new phase of life? Is this how I even wanted my life to go. Life markers. These are things that we all have, and we all have hundreds and hundreds of them, maybe even more than that. They're times where we ask questions on the precipice of something new. I, if you're thoroughly confused at this point, I have, I have two examples. The first one is this. The day of the wedding— it's the day, you know, he proposed, and she said yes, and they began to plan this excited wedding. It's going to be so great, they're going to get married, and then they go through all the details of the wedding, and, and we're not going to pick out the sandalwood-flavored candles. We need to pick out 
the lavender flavored candles because that matters because everyone's smelling the candles at our wedding. And we plan our wedding and we plan and plan it and the excitement builds and it gets more and more exciting and we're so excited for the wedding. And then the day before or the day of the wedding hits and what happens? It's a phrase that I got wrong in the last service. I thought it was wet feet and somebody goes, no, it's not. It's cold feet. I don't know what wet feet means. Then again, I don't know what cold feet means. I don't. Cold feet strikes us. And we have to stop. And if you were married, you probably hit this for a moment. And you said, hold on, hit the brakes. I need to ask some questions of myself. Do I really want to be married? Is this really the person that I want to marry? What kind of spouse am I going to be? How is this relationship going to function? Is it going to last? Are, what, should we do this at all? Cold feet. It's, it's a life marker. Second example. A couple finds out they're pregnant. And I don't know if you know how this goes, but there's this weird feeling that the couple gets that we might be pregnant. And so the husband goes to the store and gets a pregnancy test and then gives it to, to his wife. And then his wife does her voodoo magic. And then they, you know, come out of the bathroom and they, and they look at this thing, utterly confused. Because if you've ever looked at a pregnancy test, it makes literally no sense at all to look at. There's either one bar or two bars. Or, and there's actually a new one that I saw that's a smiley face system. Which makes no, if you come into this pregnancy and you're like, oh my goodness, we might be pregnant. And it's a smiley face. That's utterly confusing. What, what do you mean? Yay, we're not pregnant? Like, I don't know. But after the hours of negotiating what the meaning of the pregnancy test is, finally, you find out we're pregnant. And what happens in that very moment? Questions. What kind of parent am I going to be? Am I going to be a parent like, like my parents, who may have been a, a good parent or, or a bad parent? What kind of parent am I? Do I even want to be a parent? Is this really where I want to see my life go? We ask questions. Can I even take care of a child? That's a question I asked. And the answer is maybe. I don't know. I haven't answered it yet. Three kids. <laughs> life markers. There are times in our lives that transition us into some new phase of life, and it's always accompanied with questions. And right now, we have just gone through, and maybe some of us are still going through this, this time of question asking, this life marker time. It's called the new year, and we make new year resolutions, and all those are is questions we're asking ourselves to say, okay, here's who I was last year. What do I want to be this year? Do I want to be something different? No, I want to eat healthier. I want to lose weight. I want to be a better parent. I want to quit smoking. I want to drink less. I don't know what it is, but we begin to ask these questions. And they're good questions, honestly. But what our passage shows us is when we hit a life marker, a time when we're headed into something new, whether it be a new year or childhood or, or parenting or whatever it is for us, there's a question we often don't ask. And the question is this, who will I serve in this new time of my life? Who will I serve? Who will I be in service of? And I know for a fact that I say this, and some of you are a little like, um, hit the brakes, man. I don't serve anybody. But the fact is, I beg to differ. We all serve somebody or something. It's just a fact of life. That's who we are. We are people in service. And we can either accept the fact that we are in service to people or something, or we cannot. But whether we do or not, we will still serve something. There is uh, this famous missionary, and he was a missionary in India uh, during World War II and then after almost to the, kind of the Vietnam era. And he spent about 30, 40 years in India. 
And what he did there is he encountered all these different groups of people along the way. He encountered these rich people, these poor people, these educated people, these uneducated people. He encountered all sorts of people from these different cultures, and he found one commonality along the way. That everyone was serving something. Everyone was serving something. And he actually has this famous phrase, I'm going to paraphrase it for you, but this is basically what he says. He says, our hearts are a throne that can never stay empty. Our hearts are a throne that can never stay empty. We are built to serve and we have a throne in our lives somewhere and that throne, we cannot keep people from, or things or powers or whatever this from staying off of it. We all serve something. And the question is, What is it? So who will I serve? Who will we serve? And our scripture reading is actually about this. It's about this question, who will I serve? The Hebrew people at this point, they had just entered the land and they were about to dwell in the land and and they had to ask this question. Hold on, let's ask a question. If you don't know the story, the story goes... You have these Hebrew people, and they're living in, they had fled to Egypt at some point. And they'd grown in number, and they were huge, and, and, and the Pharaoh got nervous. This is a huge group of people. They could overthrow us. So he says, instead of letting them overthrow us, why don't we just enslave them? So he enslaves them. And they cry out to God, these Hebrew people do, and God hears them. And then God, and, and through the, the plagues and all of that, ends up freeing them. And they, and they flee to Sinai. And they're in Sinai for like 40 plus years, kind of wandering around Sinai. And after the 40 years is up, they finally pass over the Jordan River, and then they enter into this promised land, this land that God said they would get to have. He promised it to them as the land flowing with milk and honey that was the place where they were finally going to dwell. It was going to be theirs. And they enter this land, but there's a problem. There's already people there. There's already tribes there. There's already other powers there. And so for the next bit, and this is really like the whole book of Joshua until Joshua 24, is they're wandering through this land, kind of clearing it out. And some of it's actually kind of hard to swallow what happens. But they clear out this land. And finally the land is cleared out and they've pushed out all these tribes, all these people, and now they have the land of themselves. And they say, okay, now let's dwell here. Let's build houses Let's start our farms. Let's build our trades. Let's build a life here. Let's go. Ready, set. And Joshua says, hold on. And that's Joshua 24, our passage. Our passage is a giant pause button on kind of this progression into the land. And then as he pushes pause, he says, hold on. Before we enter, the, before we enter this living in this land and dwelling in it and building our lives here, hold on a second. We have to ask a question. And the question he asks, he basically only asks one. And he says this. He says, who, Hebrew people, will you serve? When you enter this land and dwell here, who will you serve? And, and starting in verse 14, this is... This is what it says. It says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Here's the part. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Hebrew people, who will you serve? And you know, what's really interesting is Joshua doesn't actually say, if you desire to serve something, who will you serve? He says, no, you're going to serve something Who are you going to serve? Are you going to look back in your past at the gods that you've encountered in the past and serve them, the gods of Egypt? Are those the people that, is that what you're going to serve? Or are you going to enter this land full of new gods and find one that you like and start serving that one? Or are you going to serve the Lord? Who are you going to serve? And if you know the story of the Hebrew people at all, the Hebrew people had an idolatry problem. 
they had a problem answering this question and often they answered it kind of the wrong way. There were times when they were tempted in, in their history to, to serve gods that were right before them, or they might even just make up gods and try to serve them. And a classic example is in Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, they're wandering through Sinai. They hit Mount Sinai. And Moses heads up the mountain to receive the law, the Ten Commandments. And he's gone for a while. And this is what happens. It says, When the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain... They gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't even know what happened to him. And Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And if you know how the story goes, it's one of my favorite stories because Moses ends up coming down the mountain and he's like, What in the world did you, what, what, what happened? And Aaron says, I don't know, it just popped out of the fire. I don't know what happened. It's just there now. There's this idol. Totally lies about it. But this story is kind of unbelievable. If you have been reading up till now, this story is just kind of unbelievable. How in the world could the Hebrew people turn to idolatry so quickly? It's kind of unbelievable. They have a God in their life who has done everything for them, has protected them, has saved them. You know, back in Egypt, it wasn't like God just snapped his fingers and, you know, the Hebrew people were poof, out of Egypt and they were saved. No. God flexed his muscles and made sure everyone knew who was responsible for this. And he did it through the plagues. One after the other after the other, all miraculous on their own. And the last one ending with the youngest or the firstborn uh, male being killed. And then they finally leave Egypt and they go into Sinai and they're like, man, I'm thirsty. And God says, you know what? Just hit that rock and poof, water comes out. It's kind of amazing. They say, yeah, but I'm hungry. Oh, don't worry. I will make bread literally rain down from the sky. Like, really? But I, I don't want just bread. Oh, here's some quail. And if that's not convincing enough to you, Hebrew people, as you're walking through Sinai and you're kind of wandering through the wilderness, you're not going to wander aimlessly. You're going to walk through Sinai and you're going to follow me. And it's going to be in the shape of this ridiculously huge funnel cloud thing that they follow all day long. And they know exactly where to go because they follow this cloud. And it's not like when it gets dark, the cloud, you can't see it anymore. No, God's like, here, I'll just light the cloud on fire and you can follow it at night. Yet... Just maybe 30 days. Who knows how long Moses is up on the mountain? He's gone. And they say, well, let's go for another God. Let's go for another. God's done all these things. Let's go for another. Is that not ridiculous? But here's the deal. We, too, are just like the Hebrew people. We're just like them. It's kind of unbelievable for us, too. Most of us would claim that we're Christians. We would claim that we believe in this all-powerful God, this God that's all-knowing, all-powerful, you know, all-gracious, all all the omnis, all everything. God is this big deal. God created all things, not just created it, but God ordered all things, like in the Genesis account— God has done everything. We believe that God can even raise people from the dead, and God has our intentions in mind. Yet we, too, worship other gods. Now, I know some of you are probably saying, "Um, last I checked, I don't worship other gods. It's surprising, but I don't do that. Yes, we do. (laughs) And we'll prove it. Here, uh, change the slides a second. This is a picture of Ra, the Egyptian sun god. He's kind of a big deal. He's got a sweet, like, hawk fish face thing. I don't know what that is, but he looks sweet. He's powerful. And Ra was really important to the Egyptians because Ra was the one that was really, he was in charge of, of the sun. And the sun in, in, in this day was a big deal. If, this, if the sun went down and then it never came back up, there'd be no farms. 
No plant life would grow. It would be the end of it. People would starve. And so they would worship this Ra, this sun god, to ensure, to appease Ra, to make Ra happy so Ra will continue to keep this orb in the sky so that food can continue to grow. And it didn't just end there. Because darkness in the ancient world was a scary thing. If the sun went down and the sun never came back up, it wasn't like, oh, well, we're out of food. It was like, no. Darkness means you have murderers and liars and people stealing from you. And horrible things happen at night. And if it stayed night, it would be bad for everybody. So we worship Ra. We worship Ra and the sun will come back up and we will be okay. Uh, Turn to the next slide. This is Haket, and if you can see, she has a frog face, which literally makes no sense to me at all, because she is uh, the fertility god for the Egyptians, and frogs, and I don't know how that works, but it matters. So she's the fertility god. And why does she matter? Why does Haket matter? Haket matters because without Haket, kind of on your side, there's a good chance that you will not have a child. You will be infertile. It'll be bad. And you know in the ancient world that really mattered because if you didn't have a a firstborn male, you didn't have an heir. And that was the most shameful thing that could really happen. And not just that, but Heket was also in charge of making sure that when childbirth happened, Heket was going to be the one to make sure that everything went smoothly and mom and child were going to be okay. So the Egyptians would worship Heket hoping that Heket would have grace on them, and of course, then they would have their firstborn, and it would be okay. And the, and the firstborn would be born, and everything would be, everything would be safe. Everything would be okay. Gods in the ancient world were related to, I think, really two or three things. Safety, peace, and prosperity. Ancient people worshipped the gods to ensure that they were safe, that there was peace in their world, and that they would prosper. And by prosper, we mean they would have food on the table. They would have kids. Life would be abundant. Where do we turn for safety, for peace, for prosperity? Where do we turn when we need those things? Do we turn to money? Do we turn to the bank account? We will put our energy and life and energy into our bank account to ensure that because if we have enough money, we will have enough safety, we will have enough peace, we will have enough prosperity. Is it our bank account? Is that where we go when we're scared? Is that where we go when we need safety? Is it our career? Do we pour all of our energy and life into our career to ensure that we're safe and peaceful and prosperous? Is that where we go for that? I know most of us are good religious people. Do we turn to our religious moralism? Is that what we turn to? We, we live our lives trying to be impeccable human beings because if we're, we're perfect humans, then there's a good chance that we will be safe, we will be peaceful, and we will be prosperous. So we make sure that we follow all the religious rules perfectly in a row. And once we do that, we're going to be okay. Because if we follow those rules, we get those things. What is it for us? Where do we go when we need these things? When we need safety, peace, prosperity, I think the only difference between ancient world people and their worshiping of the gods and us, the only difference is that we simply do not personify our gods anymore. Does that make sense? We don't personify them. We don't put a face and a name to them anymore. We avoid that part, but we still keep what's underneath. And what's underneath is still a god nonetheless. This is why when life changes happen to us, whether we're entering a new land like the Hebrews or entering a new year like 2016, 
or entering a new phase, or we're going to be parents, or we're getting married, or we're going to retire, or whatever that is, that's why we need to hit the pause button and say, who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve our paycheck? Are we going to serve our career? Or are we going to serve the Lord? Who will we serve? You know, if, if we were to stop the sermon here and say, hold on, we're just done, we're going home, and we all took this really seriously, holy cow, we need to serve the Lord, and so we all walk off, like, all right, we're going to do this, and we're going to try really hard, and we're going to serve the Lord, we would end absolutely exhausted. Because we haven't talked about what service to God looks like. What does it even mean to serve the Lord? What does it mean to serve God? And I would be willing to bet that some of us this morning, when we think of God and we think of our relationship to God and serving God, we think of appeasement. We have to serve God by appeasing him. If we do all these things and make God happy, then good things come out of it. If we appease God and we follow all God's rules and we go the right way, then we, then we get to heaven or we get rich or whatever we think that might be. And what that really is, is it's essentially we serve out of fear. We serve God because we're scared of God. That if we don't live up to God's standards, then God will boot us. And that's the end of it. And what happens, if we go down this path, service tends to look a little bit like a checklist to God. And it always ends with enough. Am I doing this? Am I praying enough, God? Am I praying? Is that how much you want me to pray? Am I doing that enough for you? Am I reading the Bible enough for you, God? Am I reading the Bible, you know, 40 minutes a day or 45 minutes a day or an hour, or however many? Am I doing that enough? Am I involved? Am I volunteering at church enough? Am I doing that enough? Am I being a good enough person for you, God? Am I following all your rules of moralism well, God? Am I doing that? And we ask enough questions. We will always be concerned with our performance before God because we fear that we won't be enough. But serving our God is not that. It's not that. Serving God, serving the Lord, serving the God of the Scriptures, serving the God who sent Jesus, is, is, it starts with gratitude. Gratitude in our hearts toward God. Thankfulness that God cares for us and cares for us so much that when we're in trouble, God will do anything to get us out of it. God will go through great lengths to ensure that we're saved. And we see it most clearly on the cross. That Jesus came and he lived and he died and he was resurrected. Why? To save us to ensure that we're going to have a future, to ensure that we can have a relationship with this God. Service to God begins with relationship. Being thankful for who God is and how God cares for us and then pursuing a relationship with Jesus. It starts, service is relationship. That's where it starts. Accepting God for who he is and loving God because of who God is and what God has done and letting that change us. You know, if we want to be moral people, if we want to be people that are dedicated to reading the scriptures or to prayer or to just live good lives where we're good parents or good workers or good spouses or whatever, if you want that, transformation has to happen. It's not through simply effort. It's through pursuing Jesus and saying, Jesus, I love you so much for what you've done and I give everything I have to you in pursuing him and pursuing him, pursuing that relationship. And in the act of pursuing that, things will start to change. You'll find that you're becoming more moral. You'll find that it's not that you just have to read the scriptures anymore, but you want to. You'll find that prayer is one of the most life-giving moments in your day. You'll find that you'll become a better parent. And so all these things will begin to happen simply through serving God. How? Through relationship with Jesus. We are changed by our relationship with God through Jesus. 
We serve God not so he will act, but because God already has. Now in this new year, as we're looking ahead, we're looking ahead at our lives and we're asking questions. Who will we serve? Who will we serve this year? Who will we serve? Let's pray.